All right. Hello, everybody. Um, I am uh, sorry for having to record this uh, lecture online, but ultimately it may be to your benefit anyway. It gives you an opportunity to see the uh, the code here that was a, we walked through here in high def. Um, I know the recording in Zoom can often be a little fuzzy, and if you're actually coming to class, then, of course, uh, the projector is clear, but uh, the way is probably blocked for about half of the screen because that's just the configuration we have to deal with. Um, so this is the example that we started uh, last week, Tuesday. Um, and uh, it's been a while, and since I'm recording this uh, over again, I'm going to go through it from the beginning so you can see it and uh, and grasp these concepts. Um, but uh, that will be what I intend to accomplish here for today. All right, so once again, uh, this is our example. This is the source code for it. Um, in the uh, uh, labs that you're performing, you, of course, don't have the source code, but you do have the binary, and you should be able to reverse engineer it. Uh, this just gives us an opportunity to see uh, more distinctly what is going on here. And in fact, we did pull this up in Ghidra previously. I believe it's this one. And let's go to the main function, make sure I have the right one here. Uh, yes, this is the one. All right. Uh, let me... Uh, let me make some changes here quick. That'll make it much better. All right, so... Uh, yes, we can see the decompiled code here. We can compare it to our source code. You should be using these examples where I give you the source code and the binary. You should be using this to practice your reverse engineering skills. You should put them both uh, up here and follow through both of them so that you can see how it is being interpreted by the decompiler, right? Because this is our source code. And for example, uh, we have some things here that we don't see in the source code and uh, you know what could they possibly be like for example here in our source code um, first of all the main is declared as int but it's undefined here in the compiler but we can see that there is an int here that is declared we also have a local variable here local 10 that's not seen here um, it is fs so off the stack uh, offset hex 28 and we don't know what that is i mean you, you might know from the lectures but if you don't well it's not in the source code i guess is what i'm saying uh we do have a car input with a 16 byte buffer okay sounds good um could that be local 20 here local 20 is undefined could be we also have car secret 16 and that has a value assigned to it of secret. We have a local 28 that's undefined. We do have a car right here. That's 16. So what happens to local 38? Let's see. Ivar1 equals the string compare of local 38 and uh, a car array uh, or the contents of local 28 in car form. So a string. Okay. So we're getting a, a lot more questions than answers, but that's to be expected in the process of reverse engineering, right? You start out with a completely blank slate, and as you go, you start to fill in details, but if you have details without context, it just raises more questions. It can be frustrating, but you, you have to puzzle through the process. It's the best way to do this. So what I do in a situation like this is I will first uh, go somewhere to something that I know, right? So right here is a printf statement, enter the password. I can see a printf statement here in our source code. So I know that line 16 in our decompiler is somewhere around line 11 in our source code, give or take. Even if I didn't have the source code, I can operate the program and I can see this output so I know roughly where I am. Okay, then we have a scanf. That's uh, this right here. In the source code, we're looking for a string, and we're depositing input into that. We know that input is the same as the buffer that was declared up here. So in this scanf, we see that there is a datum, and that is local 38. Local 38 is this right here. 
that 16 byte buffer. So I am going to rename this variable to input because that is what it is called in our source code. And if I didn't know what it was called in our source code, I'd probably still call it input or something because that's the input we're gathering from the user. We know that IVAR1 is the result of a string compare, so I'm going to rename this uh, to input compare. Uh, I'm going to shorten that. It's a little bit long. I'm going to put uh, in comp. There we go. And what is being compared is input and the value at car, or the string value at local 28. Local 28 is this right here. Here's a string compare right here. It's comparing input to secret. So local 28 must be secret. All right. We're getting somewhere. This is starting to make sense. We can see that secret in our source code has a value assigned to it of secret in this kind of, uh, I don't know, what is this? spongebob case or whatever um, but in our decompiler it is instead this hex value so hex two one four five six five five two six three four five seven three um, why would we see a difference there well it's because data is data uh, no matter what you do with it um, it's all in how it's interpreted so a value in hex could be a number like an integer uh, could be a float, like a value, that if it's in a float, it treats it as a decimal. And it can be a string. And in this case, if we hover over it, it gives us some ideas of what it could be, right? So if this was in keyword format, there we go, it's the hex value. If it's in car format, though, you can see this value is secret, the same as it is in our source code. So we know that this is actually a string, uh, well, you can see that it equals that same value that we see here. Okay. Uh, let's see. If So input compare is not declared here. The compiler has added it because there's an evaluation. There's an if statement, and it's comparing the result of the string compare. So the compiler doesn't know that it's just an if string compare. It doesn't know what the evaluation was. So it takes the most direct path and says, okay, well, maybe there's a variable that's filling that value. I, I know how to declare a variable and fill it with a value and then compare the value. So it does that. Uh, notice that the uh, indenting is way, way off. So here's a while statement. Okay, here's our while statement. And it's while true, because we have a while one here. Then we have a printf that is indented. I mean, not as much as it ought be, but it is. Same thing with the scanf and so on. Uh, but then we have puts incorrect here. We have if input compare equals zero, break. Okay, we, we don't have a break. It's just implied. Like while one, do this, but obviously if... If it's not, oh, then, you know, that's a problem. Um, the puts we have here are printfs in our original source code, but effectively it's the same to the compiler. Welcome admin, root at localhost. Um, if local 10 does not equal long f set in hex uh, in uh, in fs offset plus hex 28 uh, then okay so we still have this variable here it's up here at the top and it's again down here at the bottom so what is local 10 local 10 is a stack cookie rename to stack cookie it's the value that is added when the function, when the program runs, um, and is checked for validity prior to executing. And if it fails, then it crashes the program. So if stack cookie does not equal the value that was placed in memory, stack check failed. And that calls code to crash it, right? 
And we also have local 20, which is also undefined. It's given the value of zero. We don't have that here. If we right click and highlight forward slash, backward slice, yeah, we don't see it ever being called. This is most likely just an artifact of um, the uh, decompiler. I don't see it being used in anything, so we apparently need not worry about it. All right, so the indenting is off, but we can follow the logic here. All right, so anyway, um, what we're going to do now is we're going to run this binary with our debugger so that we can check and see what the flow of information is uh, as we go. Okay? Uh, okay. GDB. Yep. Main. Okay. There we go. All right. So now if I run this, uh, we stop at our breakpoint at the top of main. Okay. Um, we are at main plus eight. So this is actually technically the start of the main function, but then we have our preamble, right? So we push RBP onto the stack and then we move RSP to RBP. So we're, we're started. We're at the top now of our frame. The function can begin. The first instruction that we have here is a sub from RSP hex 30 hex 30 is decimal 48 so subtract 48 bytes or hex 30 bytes from rsp right now rsp is the same place as rbp because we just had a move command to put them in the same spot which means that rsp and rbp right now happen to be sitting here at offset we'll call this fded zero okay uh, here is the uh, preamble, right? And this is where we are now. FDED0. Which means that when this instruction executes, what we're going to expect to see is that RSP, RBP will remain here at FDED0, but RSP should jump 48 bytes or hex 30 up the stack. Okay, so essentially um, FDED0 will be uh, right where uh, FDF00 is right now, because that's hex 30 ahead of where we are. Okay, so we are going to... Um, next, a little step instruction here. No, next instruction. Well, next instruction here. Okay, now we're on um, main plus 12. We have keyword pointer FS hex... 28 into RAX. Now, as we just saw in the decompiled code, we know that FX um, plus hex 28 is where our stack cookie should be, right? That's the value that's going to be checked when this whole thing um, kicks off. Um, after the sub RSP hex 30, indeed, at hex offset 30 now is FDED0, where our RBP was. And we are now 30 bytes up from where we were. Hex 28 is 40, right? So it's asking essentially for the value um, at uh, offset 40 to be placed into RAX in this case. Um, why did we reserve 48 bytes or hex 30 bytes when we only needed um, hex 28, really, in order to do this? Um, it's because, um, well, number one, um, we needed 16 bytes for our input, 16 bytes for secret, that's 32 bytes, plus 8 bytes for the stack cookie, that's 40. So that's where we get hex 28 from. We get hex 30 because... Uh, the addresses in memory must be orderly, right? They need to be aligned on an 8-byte system. Look at every address here. 0 to 8, 8 to 10, 10 to 18, so on and so forth. This is advancing by 8 bytes each time. And remember, this is hexadecimal. That's why it goes from 8 to 10. 
because in between 8 is not 9 and 10. It's uh, 8, 9, A, B, C, D, E, F, and then 1, 0, right? So it has to align to 8 bytes. So it can't reserve 40 because that would be a misalignment. So we only need 40 bytes, but we are allocating 48 so that we can, number one, hold on to all of the um, variables we have declared, and two, to make sure that the stack cookie um, has enough room as well. But what we're expecting when we run this next command then is that our stack cookie should be placed into RAX. What's in RAX right now? Um, the last instruction that was executed. That's it. So let's next instruction. All right, we have moved off. Now, uh, what we're going to ask it to do is move the value in RAX, which is our stack cookie. Uh, we're going to ask it to move into an, a memory address that is at our base pointer minus hex 8. Here's our base pointer. Minus hex 8, because memory addresses are aligned at 8 bytes, is the one right directly above it. So we're expecting the value in RAX to appear here on this line. What now is in RAX? Our stack cookie. 688-8367-CF-2066-3200. We know this is the stack cookie because we saw its location in Ghidra when we reverse engineered this. We also know that it's a stack cookie because it ends in 00. zero. Stack cookies always end in 00. zero. There's a very important reason why they end in 00. zero. Well, first of all, while the value here in our register is big endian, so left to right, when placed in memory, it will be little endian, so right to left, meaning that zero zero won't be our will be will still be our last characters, but is read the opposite way, meaning that they are the first that are encountered as we go down the stack. Zero zero is a terminator for strings. So if we were to have code that accidentally leaked memory addresses with like a, a print or a write or something like that, um, without a zero zero, it would print out everything into essentially the end of memory if it didn't terminate somewhere. And this makes sure that it terminates before the stack cookie is leaked in those scenarios. Okay. So this is what we expect to see pretty soon popping up right here after the next instruction. There it is, exactly the value we expected. 688367CF2066-3200. And that value still exists here in RAX, but it won't after we run the next command, which is a ZOR EAX EAX. A ZOR is an operation where if two bits are compared to each other and they are equal, whether they are ones or zeros, then the result will always be zero. Um, meaning that the only bytes that are recorded, the only bits that are recorded rather, are those that are disparate from each other, a 1 or a 0, in which case the result will always be 1 regardless of which is compared against which. Which means that if we compare two identical values, the bits are the same, and so the result will always be 0. No flipped bits. So we're zeroing out the EAX register by comparing it to itself. So let's do that. We'll run a next instruction. And we can see, indeed, our RAX register is cleared. It is zero. The stack cookie still exists at the memory address where it was placed before. Now our next instruction, this move ABS, we're moving the value hex 21546552634573, which we know from reverse engineering the code, is the string secret, the value that is passed into our secret variable. We're going to throw it into RAX first. So next instruction. And it has been moved into RAX. Okay, now we are going to move the value of 0 into EDX. RDX right now contains the color foreground background for something. And now it is zero. 
now we're going to move the value in RAX, which is our password, into uh, the memory address at RBP minus hex 20. Hex 20. is 32 bytes. So RBP is down here. Minus hex 20 will be hex 30 minus hex 20 is hex 10 right there. So it will be this memory address it will contain the word secret. Next instruction. Indeed, there it is at uh, hex offset plus 10 minus 20 from RBP. There is our value, and we can see that it is interpreted as a string with the value secret. Now we're going to move the value of our DX into RBP minus hex offset 18. The value in our DX, if you remember, is zero. So we are zeroing out. Um, this memory address, which is already zeroed. And there it has it. Okay, now uh, we are going to um, grab, uh, this is load effective address. So this will be the address at 402004. Next instruction. Okay. Here is... R D I there we go. So four O two zero zero F was the address referenced at rip plus hex E one five and it contains the text enter the password. Okay. And on. Now it's gonna move zero into EAX, which EAX currently contains the value secret. Now that's been zeroed out. Okay. Uh, now we're going to call printf to actually print out that statement, enter a password. But I don't want to debug printf. That would be a complete waste of time. So I'm going to use next instruction, which should skip past printf and move on to the next instruction in main. And it did. All right, um, so that was a call to printf. Now we have RBP um, minus hex 30. We moved into REX. RBP is down here. Minus hex 30 is all the way up here with nothing in it. So we're going to send that to REX. And that should be zero now. It's the address, but yes. Um, so there's nothing here in RSP when it moved RSP to RAX. Um, well, it moved the memory address where RSP happened to be to RAX. It was creating a pointer. So this is the memory address where RSP is now. And that's FDEA0. So here's FDEA0. So just put the memory address into this location. Now we're going to move that into our SI. Now we're going to put the value at rip hex um, E12 into RDI. This is probably, what is this, the scan F? Must be. Um, yeah, we got the scan F coming up. So let's check R D I. Yep, that's the string in the uh, in the the scan F that got called up. That val the value like in prompt has to be kept somewhere. So it's just grabbing those out of their locations in memory. So now it's zeroing out E A X. Uh, then we have our scan F, and it should prompt me for a password. There it is. And I am uh, going to enter. I know uh, that the buffer is 16 bytes. So let's enter 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 
13, 14, 15, 16. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So we have 16 A's. We have 8 B's and 8 C's. <clears throat> so what am I expecting to happen here? Okay, well, where is um, our buffer here? Like, where is that variable going to go? We originally um, set up to here to be all of the space for our variables. Uh, we know that secret is here. So input, the variable that we are putting in here, will most likely be above it or below it. And we know that this is our stack cookie, right? So um, we know that the buffers are going to be above this. So th these four memory addresses, perhaps. Um, and then, uh, so we'll fill those. We'll, we'll overwrite the actual um, password here that we're comparing against. It should also potentially overwrite the stack cookie. I guess we'll see here in just a moment. All right, so here we are now. Uh, and yeah, sure enough. Uh, so it filled up the first uh, eight A's here, filled up uh, the, the where RSP is. The second filled up, that was the blank address there. Um, this one was our um, secret password. And this was another line down there. Hold on, let me make sure that I got my alignment correct here. Yeah, at hex offset 10 was where our password was. Uh, but we did not flow down enough to get to the stack cookie. We would have needed eight more characters, so some Ds in order to even get there. And then we would have needed um, eight more to get past it. Okay. Um, so now we're loading in, uh, let's see, the memory address at RBP minus 20. So 30 minus 20. It's looking for the Bs. Load effective address, REX minus 30, um, or RBP rather, minus 30, uh, which puts us up here to the top of the stack where we have the, th the eight A's. And uh, then it's going to move the values around for the string compare. So let's, it's next instruction, next instruction, next instruction, next instruction. Okay. There's all of our values that are loaded in there, RDI, RSI, RDX, and so on. Okay, now it's running the test to do the actual comparison. And directly after that, we have a JE, that's a jump equals. And it says that we failed the jump equals, apparently. And we got an incorrect message. So it compared against the value and uh, failed. So the value in the secret, which was all Bs, they compared it to the value which was at the beginning of our buffer, which was eight A's. Eight A's does not equal eight Bs. So we have a problem. Okay, so let's uh, bring it around again. All right, we're going to let it ask us for the correct password here again. First, of course, we have to enter in our input. So we're going to enter 16 A's. 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. We know that the input buffer was 16 bytes. So that should fill that buffer. And now I'm going to add, how about just two B's. And if we check and see the state of our stack now, um, here is the first eight bytes of our input, second eight bytes of our input, and this is where the secret password was, but it has changed. Um, so here was the secret value, but look, now it's reading BB. That's 4242 that you see here. That's BB, capital B, capital B. And uh, because I hit enter... Uh, it was needed an enter in order to return my password. Here is a null terminator, right? 
So scanf adds that automatically when you return your input in order to show that it's terminated a string. So it's only reading bb instead of this entire line because essentially the interpreter is going, okay, character b, character b, null bytes, okay, we're done. So it's just two b's, right? So this is, uh, this is going to fail because my input does not match the uh, the string here so a a the 16 a's does not equal two b's right so let's keep going here and at least see what happens and then uh, i'll show you what happens the next time this loops around right um so here we go step instruction step instruction we're moving the values um hex um rbp minus hex 20 is going to be our uh, secret value and rbp minus hex 30 is going to be our input value so the password we typed in it's moving those values into rdx and rax and then it's moving them from rdx and well it's loading the effective address of uh, those values into rdx rax and then it's moving them into rsi and rdi and then it's going to do the string compare and then directly after that's going to be our test and that will determine whether or not we are successful or not. That's how we know if we get uh, a test EAX, EAX is going to either return true or false. Um, so there we can see the comparison. Our DI is the text that we entered, which should be 16 A's, but because there is no null terminator in the string until after the two B's, it's actually displaying all of them. The value that's being compared to is the two Bs in this case. Even though it's a much longer string than just two Bs, it terminates at the two Bs. Here's the test. It will fail. There we go. Not taken. Reason. Bang Z. Um, it's because it failed. B two Bs does not equal 16 A's. Okay. Looping around. Um, we're setting back up. Here's the incorrect statement because it failed. Going again. Here's the printf. It's loading that enter the password again. And here it's queuing up that effective address again. We're getting ready for more input. Zeroing it out. There we go. Uh, now it's asking me to enter the password. The password hasn't changed. Right, This value is not updated between loops. It's never zeroed out. The source code doesn't call for it to ever be zeroed out. Um, and uh, we're in a loop. So there is an initial variable declaration, but it's never changed within the loop. There is no set secret to secret in the loop. Right, So it's going to retain the value from the last run unless you specifically tell it not to. So now if I enter two Bs, and we get to this evaluation down here. So we're going to test uh, the EAX, EAX. Now we can see it's actually comparing in RDI, two Bs, with the password value in RSI, two Bs. And when we run this test right here, we get a different result. Taken. Reason Z. I'm going to hit C to continue. And we'll get to the end of the program where it'll exit normally. And we can see that we did get our successful condition welcome admin rooted localhost and so on this is not an actual shell of course because we can see in the source code that this is just a print statement but it does show that we were able essentially to manipulate the application and get to a privileged area of the program without even touching the stack cookie so the stack cookie only protects us if we try to overwrite our returns it does not save you from an application that is otherwise shoddy. That's the lesson to take away from this example. When you're doing your vulnerability analysis, you can have all of the security measures in the world on it. But at the end of the day, if the program has vulnerabilities, or I should say the program can still have vulnerabilities despite all of those protections uh, anyway. Okay, um, then that is the example here. Um, later on, on Thursday, when we get back together, we're going to start talking about data execution prevention and ASLR and so on. So we will see you when we come back on Thursday. Take care.